learning to draw isn't just about capturing in some accurate way the structures within our subject, but it's also capturing the feel, the mood in the marks that we make, however we make them, on whatever we make them. And sometimes some of the ways we learn to draw seem to be very weighted towards the, the accuracy and perhaps not so helpful for helping develop skills to capture the, the feeling, the mood of a scene. And I think in two ways. The first way, because very often there is this focus on accuracy and it often means lines, long lines, trying to capture the overall shape of an object. So the blocking out method of the larger structures that we then move down from. But when we draw with pen, we can't erase any lines. And so what that often means is that we end up with lots of long straight lines that perhaps go beyond both literally and metaphorically their, their usefulness in capturing the mood of the scene. This is a great subject, I think, to demonstrate some of my techniques for capturing the feel of a subject, this derelict cottage. Now, if you look at the photo carefully, you'll actually see that the cottage doesn't end where I've ended it. It actually goes longer. It's a much longer old, but very derelict in. But I thought it would make a nicer drawing if we cut it off with what was a doorway and make that into the end of the building. The thing about this subject when we look at it is even though houses traditionally are subjects that we might think are well suited to drawing with lines, in fact there aren't many really straight lines at all. There's lots of almost straight lines or somewhat straight lines. But if I were to start by being quick to draw straight lines to establish some of the, the parameters, some of the edges, some of the corners of the building, then I'm going to get an effect of straightness that just isn't in this scene, just isn't in this subject. And yet it's that slight wonkiness that is very much part of what generates the derelict feel, the rundown, the it's been here for a long time feel of this building. So how do I draw to capture the feel? I mean, it really depends on the actual subject and what feel we're trying to catch. Sometimes the feel of the subject may be a sharp precision. And in fact, using a ruler is the best way to capture the, the feel, the mood of the subject. But in this case, certainly not. So what I'm trying to do is to draw as few straight lines as possible, only where I feel they really are reflected in the drawing. So we have the, the timber that's, that runs along the top of the veranda posts. And the gutter that sits on that's fairly straight. But really, otherwise, not a huge amount of straightness. The actual timber posts are relatively straight, but they've slightly twisted and warped with age as well. And they're not necessarily straight. So... I do fairly, fairly loose marks, but once, once I've established the framework of the top of the veranda leading edge and the post, my marks become much shorter and not nearly as straight. At best, I'm trying to create a somewhat rough effect when I'm going for a line straight edge, such as around the windows and the, the door. Or else I'm not doing straight lines at all. I'm trying to capture the, the feel, the effect of the surface of the building. So this is a brick building that's been plastered over in some way. And there's been various stages where parts of the plaster have come off, part of the, the rendering, the have, not plaster, but cement rendering, where part of it has come off, exposing the bricks underneath. And in some parts that's been repaired and other parts we can see the original rendered surface on the ground in front we have uh, flagging laid 
rough hewn stones that are put down and some of those have been replaced and some of them are very weathered. Again, very few straight lines. The ground level of that front wall is not straight by any means and the ground level in front of the flagged area where the grass joins is also not at all straight. So there's no point drawing straight lines there. They are only going to make our building look less derelict at the end. So I use for all of these longer lines, a series of dots that you probably noticed me making rather than drawing the line. And then I've positioned the windows and you can see the marks I've chosen to try and reflect the doorways to try and reflect the texture, the surface of the front. Now look, I made a real big mistake here. I was thinking that I had to add another column, which I did do, but I didn't realize I'd already added it. And so I then rearranged my, my reference and extended the, the gutter and tried to work out where to put the column. And then I realized I'd already done it. So now I've got this line sticking out at the left edge of the guttering, but look to see what I do at the end to hide that. It's important that we don't get too caught up in things that don't quite go right. That chimney, I also started that chimney in the wrong spot because I, I put that right hand roof line not far enough to the right. But I know that with the, the rendering I'm going to do of that really dark rusted sheet of corrugated iron that I can hide that. And so most of that won't be there. Now I can finish this chimney because I know what it looks like from the one which we can see all of. And so now I'm working on creating the effect of the corrugations. Now you'll notice too I've, I've used lots of shorter lines for the lines of the roof, for the outer edge lines. And I'm doing my best to keep everything looking slightly, slightly wonky, as we say in Australia. So the roof is a fairly important part to capture the, the feel, the weathered, derelict, rusted, bent, twisted feel and, and also because uh, the straight lines have also been affected not just by what's happened to the corrugated iron sheets, but also by the, the rotting and the sagging of the timber supports underneath. So we really want to pay attention to what they are and make sure we don't underdraw all of these things. Make sure we don't make the roof just a little higher and straighter than it should be. If anything, we want to risk going too far the other way. We, we want to risk slightly exaggerating the, the bends and the sags and the twists of the weathered elements of this house rather than, if you like, repairing them as we draw them. And so this is a good sort of subject for my way of drawing where I don't block in the overall shape, where I start at a spot and move outwards from there because it lets me make the marks that I want to have at the end and not have to make any others and particularly using positioning marks and whatnot dots and so forth to show me where to put things. I decided to put a, uh, a bush here just to help by the negative space in, bring the, that side of the building into a little more visually obvious way. It's important with these uh, flagstones to remember the perspective that we're viewing them from and how that perspective changes as they move from the right hand side of the house further away, moving back towards the left side of the house how foreshortening affects them, what impact that has. And now there's um, uh, 
probably a minute or two where I add these hatching lines. Now I didn't want to make it too dark and that's partly because I am using the 0 0.1 millimeter pen. I did a little bit of experimenting and even though this is actually a slightly larger drawing than I would normally do for my YouTube videos, I found that using the 0 0.2 millimeter pen didn't let me do some of the detail that I wanted to do without it just becoming black blobs at the scale I needed to do it. It's, it's really important that we choose the right pens for the amount of detail that we want to do in a given space for the size that we're going to draw it. There can be much more detail in a photo than we can actually have even drawing it the same size because our pen thickness, the width of our line, is going to be so much more for every line we draw than the edges that we're actually copying from the reference. And therefore, we need to make some adjustments in what we do. The, the shadows become darker as they come closer towards us, but then of course they become lighter as they get to the end as well. Now I decided to do a tree here to hide the extend, extended bit there that I accidentally did. Again, that's a wonderful thing about a scene such as this. It's very flexible with what we can add to it. And I feel like something was needed here at the end anyway to just help anchor the building and make it look a little bit less like it was just floating. But I didn't want to go into too much detail with this because it is sitting further back. I haven't put it at the same level as the house. It's to the side, but further back. And I did another, another large bush that sits further back again just to create a little group in there of the three plants. And then I decide I'll do this one that's some way in the distance. And these natural forms are great contrast to the, the bent, twisted, weathered, rusted, cracked features of this derelict house that I've tried to imitate in some way in my marks. Notice on the roof though, I don't, I don't try and do all of the marks. That looks great on the photo, but it would have been too much to have gone after too much more accuracy, particularly on the left-hand side, on the further away side. By having fewer and lighter marks on the left-hand side, it helps create the effect that it's moving back, moving away somewhat. And now just the hint of some bushes that are sort of going over a hill. In fact, the ground did slope up steeply behind this building and then there was a bit of a hill like that. And the last thing I do is some of the local color, some hatching to reflect the local color on some of the, the flagging stones. And then finally, I do some tufts of grass, partly because they're there and partly because I think it's good not to leave the foreground looking too blank. But again, foreshortening is important. Not to do clumps that all look the same, that are all the same size, even in a relatively shallow field of depth such as this, but to have a, a noticeable decrease of size as they start to move away. I make some adjustments to some of the shadows. I just darken these ones a little bit. How do you think it looks? Derelict enough? Too derelict? Not derelict enough? Anyway, whatever you think, you'll be able to have a go yourself if you want, and you'll find this photo on my channel community page. But again, I think this is a great, a great example to demonstrate how it's so much more helpful to think in terms of marks than lines. When we're thinking lines, we're more likely to be drawing more lines of greater length than we really need or want for our reference, for our finished drawing. 
And while it doesn't matter if we're doing a pencil under drawing because we can erase them, it's a totally different case when we're drawing directly freehand in ink, where that technique isn't as suitable. So I think it's great to develop a freehand pen drawing style, drawing technique, where we put marks on the paper, not necessarily lines on the paper, to help us orient what we're doing, our thinking, and create something that is still accurate to our reference. G'day, I'm Stephen Travers. So I hope you give this derelict cottage a go. And if you found this helpful, please remember to hit the like button. So why not have a go drawing it yourself? But look, whatever you draw and however you draw it, however derelict it may be, make sure you have fun. I'll see you next time. Bye.